Hello again, and yes, I'm actually back in the workshop. Um, those of you who have watched my previous videos indoors will be very surprised at that. And yes, I have the Philco uh, behind me, and um, I've actually removed the chassis from the cabinet. That's the only thing I've done. I'll put up a couple of stills to show you exactly how that was achieved. Um, this radio uh, I'm a little bit daunted with. Um, Basically, it was made in 1936. That puts it at 85 years old. In other words, when I was nine years old, this radio had already been around for a number of years. Absolutely amazing. Uh, in fact, um, nine years had it been around when I was nine years old. Um, it's known as the People's Radio, and uh, I've been doing a little bit of research. I've got the circuit diagrams and various things for it. Um, but let me just read um, some facts about it from Phil's Radio, and I'm very grateful to Phil's uh, old radio's website for some of these facts. And he says it was dubbed the People's Radio, and it was made by the British firm Philco. Um, and uh, the model number is 444. Um, and it was designed for economy. It only has one, two, three, four valves in it, including the rectifier. Um, and it was sold in 1936 for, wait for it, six shillings and, uh, sorry, six pounds, six shillings get a bit confused with that now. Um, uh, today's price that would be equivalent to about £320. An awful lot of money and although it was designed to be sold cheaply in those days it was still very expensive £6 in 1936. Um, it was still uh, a more reasonable radio than some of, the, some of the other offerings that were around at the time. Radios were very expensive but it was a time when the interest in radio was growing and people were listening to radio a lot, was listening to radio a lot more and it was a, a remarkable design as you can see from the front um the, the, the have a look at the slide now it was a remarkable cathedral like design and um it was made in bakelite now at the time Bakelite was cheaper to produce than wood, so although a lot of the uh, more expensive sets were in wooden cabinets, this one was actually made in Bakelite, and it's an absolutely amazing one. And this particular model, the cabinet is immaculate. It's not been cleaned, but I can't find a crack on it or a blemish on it anywhere. Um, it looks like it's been very, very well looked after. Um, there is one thing about it which is slightly worrying me, and that is the valve lineup, because it has uh, the, the the output valve was specially designed for this radio. And um, if I could uh, read a little bit of this <coughs> to you now, um, three of those tubes are well were well known: the six A six A seven and the seventy eight E, but the output Pento, this this thing here um, was a PEN DD61. Now, any Philco um, uh, um, experts will know that that valve was made especially for uh, Philco and for this particular radio, and they are incredibly difficult to get hold of. Um, there's probably more radios around now, more of these radios around, than there are these valves to actually fit into them. So you can imagine, before I turn this on, I'm going to be very, very careful um, running up on a lower voltage first, just to make sure that um, that I don't blow the thing up, because if, if anything happens to this, or if this is faulty, it's very doubtful whether I can get a replacement for it. I've been on to eBay, nothing. I've been on to um, Watford Vols, it's not even listed. Um, and uh, I've been on to the um, collector's sites for, for uh, antique valves, and it's not, again, it's listed, um, and, but nothing, uh, nothing about it which says, oh, here it is, here. Um, it's made in Great Britain. Uh, it's a double diode pentode, and it's power output valve. 
made by Mazda um, and uh, it has a very special heater voltage I think that's the problem with it I believe there is some research which says um, you can modify uh, the, 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 the circuits to, to um, accommodate the heater uh, voltage it has. It's a British 7 pin old MSMA uh, and it's got a top cap. The filament is 6.3 volts um, uh, and at 1.2 amps. Ooh, um, and this, it's made for Philhill UK and uh, it was made in the 1930s for this particular radio. So as you can see um, uh, it's a very special uh, radio set um, and I've taken it out of the cabinet. I'm going to give you some shots now of uh, the inside of it. It's not been cleaned at all. This is originally as it was. Um, so I'm going to give you some shots of that now and then um, we'll come around in a few minutes to applying the power to it the first time it's been applied in decades so let's have a look inside the inside of the cabinet is quite dirty um, cobwebs and, and, and the accumulation of dust over many many years but it's not damp and that's one of the things I look for when I look at these old sets there's no damp there at all um, just lots of dust one um, worrying little bit, and I've not looked under the uh, under the chassis yet, but there is um, wax here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, um, and uh, but there is wax here, um, and uh, that it looks like it's adjacent to the electrolytic capacitor, the can capacitor, which would be adjacent above it. So I have suspicions that that capacitor might be dry. Coming back to the chassis itself, which I've just simply slid out um, from the cabinet, uh, you can see obviously lots of dust on the valves, um, and the and in the foreground of the of the picture, you can see the the uh, the pen uh, DD sixty one, um, and uh, that's the one where. Um, we have to be very careful because they are such rare beasts. So let's have a closer look at it. Now um, I'm going to turn the chassis over now so that um, we can see underneath. And this will be my first look as well. So all very exciting. So this will be my first glimpse underneath. I'm moving that away a little bit. Um, Obviously these leads are in a bit of a state. And I'm going to very gently turn it onto its side. Make sure it doesn't fall anywhere. And let's put some uh, light on it. Oh few spider remains there um, but apart from that it looks incredibly clean um, yeah uh, capacitors are um, look quite leaky and wet so they're going to have to be replaced in any case but uh, let me give you a close-up now of under the chassis. Let's get rid of that spider. Okay, so let's scan down from top to bottom. You can see what I mean when I talk about the capacitors looking a little bit, um, uh, a little bit waxy and uh, wet. Um, this one particularly here. Um, yeah, they probably will have to be replaced. I'm still tempted to power it up on low power and see exactly what happens. Um, moving on down. It's actually remarkably clean uh, inside. Um, there's another couple of caps there which well that one particularly looks in a pretty bad way. Um, let's just zoom in on that one. 
yeah that doesn't look good at all and I'll try and get a, um, a glimpse of the bottom of the electrolytic capacitor down the bottom I think that's it there and I think that's where the wax has been coming from or it's been coming from those other that other paper capacitor um, now actually it doesn't look too swollen um, at all it doesn't look too bad but my suspicion I think remains on that one um, uh, for dripping wax into the cabinet um, anyway that's the bottom of the thing um, and not too bad at all so what I'm going to do now uh, is to uh, apply some power to it through my safety circuit and this will be the first time that power has been applied for decades so let's see what happens I've decided that um, I've decided that actually before applying power I'm going to replace the, the mains cable on it. It's frayed in a lot of places and um, it's not looking in the best of conditions. Uh, the thing is not earthed either. So what I'm going to do, and there's the connections for it, what I'm going to do is replace that with an earthed cable and a suitably fused plug. Okay, so just going to remove um, the mains cable. On these things, all the connectors are quite big, so they suck um, they suck heat out from small soldering irons. Maybe I should have used my gun. Oh no, here we go. So that's that one out. That's the live. And let's try this one. Interestingly, there's only a knot on it as a restraint. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually cut that through. Well, it's 2.21 on Saturday the um, 17th of January 2021. Um, I've connected a new mains cable and verified that that is indeed an earth point. I've also put a meter on the um, HT uh, line um, and I've ensured that the on-off switch is indeed on. I've got my safety circuit set to bypass. I've got cable power coming in. I'm going to turn this on and this is the moment when I'm going to switch power on. Now there could be a loud bang um, or it could nothing could happen. Right. That's encouraging. That light has come on and you see my voltage has gone up to 200 so I've got HT coming up there. Is there going to be any sound? It needs some time obviously to warm up. So I've got Dare I Go to full power. Um, I don't know. Part of me is saying no. Part of me is saying I ought to. So let's take it off bypass. 250... 200 volts on the HT and nothing smoking. Nothing blowing at all. Um, and that's dropping off now, 128 
Oh, not a good sign. And uh, as I suspected, it's that capacitor which is boiling. Uh, and I think you can see it boiling now. Um, <laughs> wow! And I, I knew there was something wrong there because I could actually see the um, the voltage, the HT voltage, dropping right off. So on uh, on full volts, it started to kirk. So it was a good job that I initially went on to uh, on to half voltage. Anyway, you actually witnessed um, the first smoke from this Philco radio. And uh, what I'm going to do now is replace that, and you can see the wax dripping from it even now. So that explains why the wax, and it's exactly the same place as it was on the bottom of, of the sh of the cabinet. So that's why. Um, well, there's the offending capacitor, and it's some um, leaky bits that have coming out of it. Um, so I've replaced that now, uh, obviously with a much smaller 650 volt working equivalent capacitor um, and that's there. So um, I'm going to turn on again and let's see what the meter does uh, with bringing up our voltage this time. So we're ready to switch on again. I'll go to bypass initially. And we are coming up. Now I'm going to go to take the bypass off. Now that's looking much healthier. We're up to 400, 400 volts on the HT line. Um, and it stabilised it 396. So we have something there but there's absolutely no output on the radio at all. So obviously there's there's another fault on there. Um, I'm going to have to uh, um, fault find that a little bit further. But this, of course, um, is a good start and we have uh, HT. So I'm going to turn off now. And uh, But stable 402 volts, which is pretty good really. So that seems to be working. So I'm going to turn off now and we'll watch that voltage disappear. Well, thank you for watching part one of this video. At least I'm back and at least things are progressing. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more uh, research now on the, on the circuit um, and find out exactly um, why we aren't getting an output from it and do some more passive checks as well. But that will all be in part two of the video. I think this one's gone on quite long enough now. Um, thank you for watching and uh, thank you for bearing with me about actually getting back into the workshop and doing some stuff. Thank you for enjoying my smoke um, my smoke signals from the receiver, uh, but things are beginning to look hopeful. So thank you very much for watching, and as always, take care. See you in part two.